So hello and welcome to this uh, tutorial on using the GeoClaw software for modeling tsunamis, storm surge, dam break problems, and other flow over uh, topography. Uh, this is a general package of, of software that I'll tell you a little bit about and go through a short tutorial about how to use it. Um, so my name is Randy Levesque. I'm one of the core developers of GeoClaw. And uh, I am speaking to you from the University of Washington in Seattle, if you're not familiar with this area. Um, Seattle is here in the Puget Sound, and one reason that we worry a lot about tsunamis in this region is that every few hundred years there's a magnitude 9 subduction zone earthquake, um, a Cascadia subduction zone offshore, and the next time that happens the, uh, the coast of Washington is going to be in serious trouble, so a lot of what we do uh, in my group is to work on modeling the coast of Washington and assess it for tsunami hazards and help design vertical evacuation structures and other things. So we've been using GeoClaw pretty heavily in some of these applications. Um, so I'm going to start with some slides to introduce the uh, methods and the software a little bit and then go into a hands-on demo. Um, I hope this is coming through. Can somebody just respond to let me know that you're hearing this okay? I can hear you. Yep, I can hear you well. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so um, the software is based on the CLAWPAC package of software, which stands for Conservation Laws Package. And this is a package that we started developing in 1994 and has been kind of a continuous development ever since that solves systems of hyperbolic partial differential equations that model wave propagation in, in various uh, applications areas. Uh, the tsunami and geoclaw aspect of it started around 2004, around the time of the big Sumatra uh, earthquake and tsunami, in some pieces worked by David George, um, and he applied claw back to tsunamis and, and started tsunami claw, and then as we realized that it was useful for many other sorts of overland flow, it, it morphed into geoclaw. Um, Dave George still works on, on geoclaw and on what's something he calls declaw for debris flow. He's now at the Cascades Volcano Observatory near down near Portland, Oregon, um, and works on a, a version of the code that can also be used for landslide and debris flow modeling, but I won't talk about that version today. Um, just some features of the GeoClaw software in general, it's for solving two-dimensional shallow water equations typically over topography. Uh, and it handles shoreline or the edge of the flow by allowing some grid cells to be dry. If the depth of water is zero, they're dry, it's positive, they're wet, and that can change dynamically from time step to time step. So we don't impose boundary conditions at a moving boundary. Instead, we just handle the interface between wet and dry cells. Um, another big component of GeoClaw is that it uses adaptive mesh refinement quite heavily in a sort of block structure manner, um, which I'll show you some examples of in a moment. Um, and then within each adaptive grid, it uses shock capturing, finite volume methods, high resolution methods that have been developed over the, the last 30 years or so um, that effectively um, capture the flow even if you have discontinuities forming in, in a hydraulic jump, for example, as a, a wave comes on shore and becomes highly nonlinear. Um, we don't have sort of massive parallelization built into the, the GeoClaw software, but it does work with OpenMP on shared memory machines. Um, and so I do a lot of tsunami modeling just on my laptop using four cores, for example, or on um, um, uh, nodes of a cluster using maybe 12 or 24 cores. We'll have used it with 100 cores or so for some large problems. The main ClawPack software is all written in Fortran, the sort of adaptive mesh refinement code, but we use Python pretty heavily for the interface for specifying the input parameters and for plotting a solution. So I'll do some examples of that if you want. Uh, all of the development of ClawPack and GeoClaw as part of ClawPack still is uh, developed on GitHub. Um, so you can sort of follow what's going on through the pull requests and discussions there. We use continuous integration using Travis so that every time there's a pull request for the test get, get run. Um, there's a number of people who have been heavily involved in, in developing different aspects of ClawPack and GeoFly. Just listed two people who've been the, the core developers uh, over the last few years. And Marsha Berger who developed the adaptive mesh refinement portions of ClawPack originally and is still heavily involved. 
Al Manley, a former student now at Columbia, who's worked a lot on storm surge modeling in particular with GeoThaw. Uh, David Ketchison at Kaus uh, has also contributed a lot to the, the Thaw software. Um, if you're interested sort of in how we go about developing this large suite of uh, software, uh, we have a paper from a couple of years ago that sort of describes a lot of our development uh, approaches. It may be interesting. So GeoClaw is specific for the shallow water equations. There's also some multi-layer shallow water equations uh, in GeoClaw that Kyle's been developing. Um, and as I said, Dave George, for example, has been looking at more complicated realities for landslides and debris flows. But the basic code that we use for tsunami modeling in particular uh, is the two-dimensional shallow water equations. So in these equations, H is the depth of the water, good. Uh, U and V are the velocity in two horizontal directions. Uh, and they're sort of depth averaged velocity, so there's only a single velocity at each point. Um, this one half gh squared appearing in the momentum equations is the hydrostatic pressure, and the B on the right hand side, capital B, is the bathymetry or topography, the, uh, describing the topography that the flow is going over. Um, if B is negative, then it's underwater bathymetry. If B is positive, then it's above shore topography, although as the the way uh, inundates dry land, um, the depth can be positive even in regions of positive topography. So as I mentioned, there's a number of applications that GeoClaw has been used on, and I'll show a couple of examples, um, starting with a, a dam break problem, just because it nicely sort of illustrates the adaptive mesh refinement and the wetting at the margin of the flow. Uh, and then a couple of examples from tsunami modeling, which as I said is what I mostly work on. And if you're interested in that, the, the animation that I showed at the very beginning and a, a number of other animations and, and reports on different projects can be found at, at this link. Um, all of these green links in the PDF file should be clickable once those will be shared. Um, I won't talk about storm surge in particular, but here's a, one paper in particular by uh, Kyle and Clint Dawson on comparing uh, GeoClaw to answer for a storm surge simulation. So um, just to start showing you how the adaptive refinement works, this is a, a test problem that uh, Dave George ran many years ago now on the Malpasse Dam failure from 1959, where this, this dam in France was filled up and shortly thereafter uh, exploded and there was a large flood that went down the valley. The dam was up here at the top of the valley, the flood went down, uh, down this valley, and there was quite a bit of information about exactly how it progressed down the valley as it knocked out to think power plants along the way, our stations. Um, and so it's been used as a test problem for various uh, overland flooding codes. Um, so these plots uh, came from his work in 2011, which you can find in this paper. Um, and it illustrates that we start with a Cartesian grid over, a, in this case, I think we just use coordinates that were meters. Often we use latitude and longitude, but it's still logically rectangular, the grids that we use. And we typically start with a very coarse grid in regions where nothing is happening, where the dry land is, doesn't need to be modeled with any um, great resolution since there's no flow over it. So we start with a very coarse grid, like they did, with 400 meter grid cells. And then what you see here is a level two grid, which has been refined by a factor of eight in each direction, in this case, I guess, from 400 meters down to 50 meters. And you see the original reservoir behind the dam, which was here. And then at this initial time, there's only two levels, but then as the flow starts to move, um, additional levels, a level three grid is added here where the grid lines aren't shown, but it's at a 12 meter resolution. And then these even smaller patches inside that are at a three meter resolution over the topography. Um, and as the water flows down the valley, the regions of refinement automatically adapt to follow the flow. So there's some criterion that's built into the code, uh, and there's actually several that the user can choose from to specify how to do the adaptive refinement. But the basic idea is that at each time step, um, well, each regridding time, which might be after several time steps on each level, you would flag a certain set of points as needing refinement. In this case, maybe because there's water there, so flagging criterion can just be any wet cell gets flagged. And then those wet cells, the flag cells get 
clustered into rectangular patches. That's all of these little rectangles that you see here are level four patches, so they're all the same resolution, but they're, they've been chosen to try to cover the area that was flagged with relatively few other cells refined that hadn't been flagged, but also you don't want too many individual grid patches because you have to exchange information between patches each time step as boundary conditions in the, in the explicit method that's used to advance the solution. So there's a, a criterion and a parameter that can be set also in the input that controls how many patches it tends to make. Uh, and then as the flow evolves, it would uh, define more and more. I wanted to mention one other problem of this nature, if you're interested in dam break problems or overland flow, because this paper just came out last week, and in fact, just today, it, it made the EOS AGU website as an editor's highlight, so I'm very happy about that. Uh, this is a paper of some work by uh, Mike Trzewski, a uh, PhD student in Open Space Sciences here, working with Kate Huntington uh, and myself on the geoflaw modeling. Uh, and he modeled a, a lake that was created by a landslide in the Himalayas in the year 2000, that landslide failed and drained the lake, and there was a big flood that went hundreds of kilometers downstream. So he actually modeled a 400 kilometer stretch of this river down to a resolution of 15 meter grid cells in some cases, compared different resolutions, different friction factors, uh, compared the numerical results coming out of GeoClaw with some field data from field work they've done in this area. Uh, some nice results, and there's a number of uh, animations that are in the supplementary materials along with this paper. So, I recommend taking a look at that if you're interested in, in this type of problem. So, going back to the shallow water equations and tsunami modeling, um, so I, I mentioned that adaptive refinement is, is crucial. It lets us follow, for example, complicated river valleys with putting fine grids only where there's, there's water, essentially. Uh, and we can also handle the wetting and drying. The other thing I wanted to point out here, the first issue listed here is that there's, in the case of tsunami modeling or storm surge, where you're looking at waves, long wavelength waves over the ocean, um, you typically have waves that out in the deep ocean are very small amplitude compared to the depth of the ocean. And we're solving typically on an ocean at rest initially before things start moving in the tsunami. Um, and so if you look at these equations in the case where u and v, the velocities are both zero, then everything drops out of the momentum equations except the hydrostatic pressure, the one-half gh squared, and the right-hand side, which depends on the, the variations in topography. And those two terms can both be very large because you have big variations in the, in the depth of the ocean. Um, and so you need to maintain a balance between those two terms. And so the way that the numerical methods are implemented have to be done in, in a manner that we call a, a well-balanced method, where you have this balance uh, in a steady state situation that's exactly preserved by the numerical method. And then that has to also happen when you're using adaptive mesh refinement because you have uh, patch boundaries that are all over the ocean in regions where there is no tsunami yet, for example. And so getting that to work properly with the adaptive mesh refinement um, and together with the wetting and drying as, as flow inundates on land um, was one of the original sort of major challenges of getting everything working in geotech. Um, but that's working well now. Um, so just to give you an idea of the sort of scales I'm talking about, this is an example that we'll look at as a test problem in a little bit. This is the 2010 uh, tsunami generated by an earthquake off the coast of Chile. Um, and this is three hours after the earthquake where the, the wave has propagated out. This point that's indicated here uh, with a number is what's called a DART buoy, a deep ocean assessment and reporting of tsunamis. That DART stands for the pressure gauges at various locations in the ocean on the, on the seafloor that can measure the hydrostatic pressure of water well enough to, to sense the tsunami going by, which is a major part of the early warning system for tsunamis in the world. Um, it's also a great source of data for doing comparisons and validation of our code. So when you look at this example, that's one place where we'll put a gauge, computational gauge, to see um, what 
tsunami is reported there and how it compares to the actual tsunami. But at the moment, what I want to show you is that along this transect, what it looks like if we take a cross section of the topography. So down on the bottom here, and this is shown at sort of the resolution that we might be using for the, the tsunami out in the deep ocean. And so it's looks like a, a piecewise constant approximation to the seafloor. Uh, this is the coast of Chile on the right, and it goes down to a trench here that's more than six kilometers deep. Um, and then the, the average depth of the ocean is about 4,000 meters or so. Um, and you can see that from one grid cell to the next, you can have jumps of uh, hundreds of meters. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the surface here, well, it looks like nothing is happening here, but if you zoom in on the surface in the top plot over the top 20 centimeters, what you see is the tsunami wave. Um, and for scale here, this is 500 kilometers. So the, the wavelength of the tsunamis is very long. Uh, the amplitude, on the other hand, is very small compared to the depth of the ocean. It's as it approaches shore, it can amplify it through the shoaling and, and give much deeper run up in some areas, especially in the, the near shore area, the part of the tsunami that is actually headed to Chile. Um, but the part that's traveling across the ocean is typically less than a meter amplitude and very long wavelength. And it's very important to be able to model these small changes in the surface relative to the huge changes in the topography underneath it. And we're solving the Again, the shallow water equation with this piecewise constant symmetry uh, underneath it. So this well balancing is a critical aspect in doing tsunami simulation or storm surge simulation. So here's one more example of a adaptive mesh refinement in the context of a tsunami model. Uh, this was a, a test problem from a benchmarking workshop a few years ago on looking at currents and harbors, modeling the currents that are generated by tsunamis can be even more sensitive and difficult in modeling the, the actual inundation depth. Um, so there was a workshop um, in Portland a couple of years ago sponsored by the National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program where about a dozen different tsunami modeling groups came together and tested our codes on a number of different benchmark problems. And this was one of them. So this is uh, the North Island of New Zealand you see here in the center and um, in um, the region where we have the adaptive refinement. This is 15 and a half hours after the uh, Tohoku earthquake off the coast of Japan in 2011. Uh, and the, if you zoom in further, then what you see on the right here is an entrance to this Tauranga Harbor in New Zealand, where there were some gauges that measured both the, the amplitude and the velocity of the waves as they came into that harbor. Um, so here's a zoom on the entrance of that harbor. There was a ABCP acoustic Doppler current profiler in the entrance here that measured current velocities. Uh, there was also a, a point out here and another point tight gauge uh, in the harbor where the, the surface elevation was measured. And what you see on the right is the, the actual data from those locations after removing the tide. We always have to retide the data that comes out of these sort of pages or, or dark buoy data. Um, and so this A beacon out here, what you see here, the black is the, the actual observed surface elevation after detiding at that point, while the red is the geocost simulation over the same um, time period. And again, remember this is 15 and a half hours after the earthquake, we propagated all the way across the ocean and we're capturing waves that are less than half a meter high at this location. Uh, and at this tide gauge inside the harbor, similar sort of results. The velocities of the current, as I said, are harder to capture accurately, but we still get at least the right sort of order of magnitude. This is the east-west, north-south components of velocity and then the, the total speed. Um, so that was the, the test problem that we were looking at in this case. And to uh, go back to the sort of adaptive mesh refinement, as you can see, we have a very fine grid here near the harbor uh, and a relatively fine grid around the, the North Island of New Zealand. But going back to the ocean, we see that Australia is not very well resolved. North America is not resolved. Japan doesn't even appear at this resolution. Um, but if we went back to the initial time, or say three hours after the earthquake, then our adaptive mesh refinement is centered around Japan where the earthquake was generated. And at this resolution, we're not resolving New Zealand at all, so we don't see the, anything in the zoom pictures. And then as the tsunami propagates, we use our adaptive mesh refinement to 
follow the waves, in this case, we're interested in the ones headed towards New Zealand, so we put some guidance into the code to say, follow the portion of the waves that are headed in that direction. Um, so nine hours after the earthquake, by using adaptive mesh refinement, um, we've calculated the tsunami up to this point using only about three minutes of uh, wall time on a quad-core MacBook laptop computer. Um, so propagating across the ocean, since we don't need terribly fine grids in the ocean, um, and if we judiciously use the adaptive mesh refinement, we can actually solve a tsunami propagation problem quite quickly across the ocean. Then things start to bog down once we start refining near the, the destination. So 12 hours after the earthquake, we, the waves are starting to approach New Zealand and we're starting to refine North Island. We still don't have much resolution of the harbor. Uh, this is five minutes of elapsed time now. And then as we start to refine the harbor, you see the, the uh, computing time starts to go up dramatically. 19 minutes to get to this point where we're now resolving the harbor fully. And then three hours of computing time to get up to 15 hours of simulated time. And almost all of that work is in computing what's going on right around this harbor. But by using adaptive refinement, we only need to put those very fine grids uh, right where we need them. And typically, in, in the, we're doing inundation studies of, of modeling currents and harbors, we want to go down to, um, well, in many locations, there's one third arc second data available, which is about 10 meter resolution uh, in the attitude direction, for example. So that's very, very fine compared to the grids that we're using out in the ocean. Okay, so let me uh, turn now to saying a little bit about how to use GeoFlaw. And, and the first thing to do is to, to get it installed. Um, so I'm not going to go through that in detail, but we do have a, a recently revamped uh, documentation page on installing Clawback that we hope makes it a little easier to follow. Uh, and in many cases, you can simply do it with a, a pip install. Um, Basically, this downloads a version of the code and, and sets a Python path and, and some other paths that are needed to find things in Clawpack. Um, there's also a version of Clawpack called PyClaw, which is kind of a pure Python version, but it still uses Fortran Riemann solvers, the kind of basic building block of these finite volume methods for hyperbolic problems. And so it also recompiles some Riemann solvers using f to pi so that they can actually be called from, from Python. Um, but that's not used for GeoClaw directly. GeoClaw, we typically uh, use a much bigger set of Fortran routines and compile it um, So there are various other options for using Clawpack besides using the pip install. You can clone the, the repository and, and uh, then do a pip install locally or, or just use Python path uh, environment variable. Uh, you can also use Docker. We have a Docker file that is uh, relatively easy to use Clawpack by bringing down all of the dependencies that it needs, the G4 can as well as several different Python packages so that you don't have to install anything else on your laptop. You have Docker installed. Um, there's also options like um, um, Binder for Jupyter Notebooks, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, anyway, if you do install it on your own computer, uh, what you'll find when you look in the Clawpack directory, the main directory is that there's actually uh, the way it's organized on Git, there's several sub-repositories. Um, there are often sort of different people who are working on developing things in, in different repositories. So we split up the whole Clawpack project into several different sub-repositories that are interrelated and typically use each other. So there's a there's a PyClaw repository and a classic repository, which is the for the Fortran code working on a single grid without adaptive mesh refinement. The Riemann uh, directory or repository has Riemann solvers for many different hyperbolic problems, acoustics, subduction, Euler equations of compressible flow, various other things, elasticity. Um, Claw util is some utilities that are used all over the place. And then VizClaw is a set of visualization tools written in Python for visualizing what comes out of either PyClaw or AMRClaw or GeoClaw. Um, AMRClaw is the uh, adaptive mesh refinement version of Clawpack uh, that is more generic and can be used for compressible gas dynamics, for example. Uh, while GeoClaw is, uses many of the routines directly from AMR Claw, but then has its own version of many of the routines in order to 
properly handle flow of the topography. Um, there's also a doc repository where we uh, have all of our documentation, which we develop using Sphinx, and then that's pushed to another repository that displays it on the websites. Um, and then when you install the basic thought pack, you don't automatically get the apps repository, but we have another repository that has um, a number of different applications in it that we've been developing or that other people have contributed. Um, in particular, there's a tsunami subdirectory and a surge example subdirectory, um, which is actually a, a sub-repository of, of apps. Um, and there's a notebooks directory that has some additional Jupyter notebooks that illustrate how to use some of the tools and flop out and geoclock. Uh, within GeoClaw, if you go into that directory, what you what you find, um, there's a set of documentation on that. If you go to flopac.org, and the GeoClaw documentation that describes all these things in more detail. Um, but the main flopac slash GeoClaw directory contains a, a source subdirectory, SRC, that has in particular the source code for shallow water equations. Um, and it also has a, a Python subdirectory that has a number of Python tools that are specific to working with data that goes into or comes out of GeoClaw. And in particular, there's a, a module called Topo Tools that uh, is designed to help work with topography files, DEM files that describe the topography, but that goes in as one of the inputs in GeoClaw. And DTopo Tools, DTopo we use to refer to moving topography, changes in topography. Uh, so for example, when an earthquake happens, the seafloor is uplifted, and there, there's a, a standard way of generating seafloor displacement from slip on a fault plane called the Okada model that basically solves a, a elastic half space problem and computes the uplift of the surface due to a dislocation deep in the interior. And that Okada model, for example, is implemented in the Etoco tools module. And so you can read in fault parameters for earthquakes in several different formats and to calculate the seafloor deformation that goes along with it. Um, also within Flopac slash GeoClaw and also in the other repositories like AMRClaw and Classic, there's a test um, directory that has some basic tests. Uh, Travis CI is, is a continuous integration system that gets automatically invoked any time we do a pull request on GitHub and it runs all of these tests and reports if any of them fail, which is one way to help make sure that we don't break things inadvertently as we're modifying the code. It's really important since we have these different repositories coupled together that may get changed independently. And so some of these tests are sort of interdependent between repositories as well. Um, there's also in many of the Clawpack repositories, including GeoClaw and the examples directory, which has within it several subdirectories with different examples to help get you started. So the examples we're going to look at today are based on the example that's in this uh, Chile 2010 uh, example that comes built into GeoClaw. Um, although I was disturbed to find the other day that uh, there's a make topo.py routine in there that's currently broken because of the way the URL is not getting properly resolved. The make topo.py downloads some topography data that's needed to run this example. So if you actually download the GeoClaw and go into that directory and try to run the example, it doesn't work at that moment. Um, so the example that I'll show you that's on this GitHub repository specific for this tutorial uh, has that fixed, and you could use that to improve make topo.py or the one that's in the master branch on GitHub um, if you want to run the example that's in the uh, current version 550 implementation, which hopefully we will be updating soon. So uh, as I mentioned in, in GeoClaw, mostly what we're running is the actual Fortran code. Um, and we have a, a makefile system to help check dependencies so that you don't have to recompile all of the routines of, of GeoClaw every time you change one routine. Or, um, if you changed the specification of how you make, want to make the plots. So you don't necessarily have to rerun the code in order to remake the plots. Um, so it's a little bit complicated. There's some documentation that you might want to read through. But the basic idea that um, is important to understand is that our basic makefile has 
definition of a set of targets that start with dots. And when you do make dot data, for example, um, it takes setrun.py, which I'll talk about in a moment, which is a, a file that a Python script that sort of sets up the input parameters for GeoFly in a relatively user-friendly way. And it converts that Python code, runs that code to create a set of uh, files that typically end with dot data that are read in by the Fortran. So the Fortran code actually reads in a, a simpler format than what's specified in setrun.py. And doing make that data run set run and creates the input to the Fortran. Um, but it also, when you do make that data, creates a file called dot data, which is a hidden file on Linux. So if you type just ls, you won't see it unless you do ls minus a to see the hidden files. Um, but it, it uses the date of creation of that file for checking dependencies. So if we later rerun the code, it knows whether it has to rerun setrun.py in order to refresh the data or whether it's already up to date. Basically. And then there's similar targets like, like .exe would compile the Fortran code, um, checking dependencies um, and making sure that you don't recompile a routine if it's already been recently compiled. In that case, it uses also the, the dates of the .o file uh, compared to the .f or .f. Um, and then make that output would run the code, um, but it checks the dependencies to make sure that the Fortran code is up to date and that the data is up to date before running the code. Uh, and similarly, make that plots will um, use another Python script set plot dot to that specifies what sort of plots you want. But before doing that, it would check that the output is actually up to date. Um, if you do make plots without the dot, just make plots, then it would just run the plotting routines based on whatever output is currently there without checking whether it was up to date with the setrun.py, for example. So setrun.py, as I mentioned, we'll look at one in a moment. It's, it's a Python code that allows you to set up the input data and has lots of comments in it. Typically, if you're starting a new example in using GeoFlow, you don't want to write this from scratch. You want to find a example that does something similar to what you're trying to do and just copy it over and modify what you need to to, to change it. Um, and again, when you execute the setrun.py or type make data or make that data, then it creates a set of files that are actually read in by the program. Um, and then when you run the code, it creates a directory which typically we use underscore output as the name of that directory, but that's specified in the make file. You can change that if you want to. Um, and within that directory, it has a, a set of files uh, that have names like fort.t0000, fort.t0001, and so on. Uh, one for each output time. How many output times you want is specified in the, the setrun.py. But for each output time, there's a very short file that just has some basic information about that particular output time, what the time is, how many AMR grids there are at that time, a bit of other information. And then if you're creating ASCII output, uh, there's a set of fort.q files that go along with it that actually have the solution on all of the grids at that corresponding time. And, um, you also have the option when you run the code to specify binary output, which is considerably smaller, but can't be looked at correctly as easily, um, in which case, uh, the fort.q files would only sort of have headers for each grid that tell what size each grid is and what the grid resolution is, and the actual data, the solution values on that grid would end up in the corresponding fort.p files. And then in the set plot, you have to specify whether you're reading in ASCII binary as well, consistent with what you output to. And typically, at each output time, if you're using adaptive Mesh refinement, there may be many grids, there can be thousands of grids at each time in some of the applications we've been looking at. So there would be a, a header for each grid followed by the data or with the data in the, the binary file. And then we also have um, plotting tools. Uh, there's a routine in each application or example directory called setplot.py that sets up how you want to do the plotting. And we kind of came up with our own a little language for specifying the plots because of the fact that we're always plotting or usually plotting adaptive mesh refinement data. So we don't just have a single grid of data to plot. We typically have 
hundreds or thousands of grids that are overlapping each other and that are at many different grid resolutions. Um, in some areas, you want to show color maps appropriate for water and other areas for dry land if you have water intruding on top of the land. And so trying to kind of write the, the Python code to do all of that and loop over all the grids gets a little bit messy. And so we've tried to simplify that for the user by writing all that code in the, as part of the BizClaw package and then providing a, a language for specifying what kind of plots you want and then it will hopefully produce the plots that you want. So the basic idea in set plot is that you can specify for each frame, for each output time where you have data, you can specify one or more figures that you want to appear at that particular time. And then each figure, you can specify one or more axes that should appear on it, maybe just one axis, or maybe you've got subplots with a two by two array of axes. And then within each axis, you can specify what plot items you want to appear on that axis, which are typically either a curve or a contour plot or a pseudo color plot or something like that. Um, and then there are various attributes you can set for each of these items to, to specify what contour levels are, for example, what colors they should be that. Um, and again, there's a lot of examples already in the, the GeoClaw and PopHack repositories in the examples directories and and some documentation and examples in the main Wapak documentation. But, so you can often find something that's very similar to what you want to do and just copy it and make a few adjustments. So the set plot, um, yeah, this is kind of this basic, simplest version of a set plot function. It would specify, um, it takes plot data, which is a, a particular Python object that's defined by this claw plot data um, class. And then that has a method called new plot figure that you would call as many times as you want to create different figures. And then within each figure, you would call the new plot axes as many times as you want to create different axes of, of figures that should go on the map, or the axes that should go in that figure. And then within each axis, for each of these plot axes, it has a a method called new plot item that you can call multiple times to specify different types of items to be plotted on top of each other in that particular set of axes. So we'll briefly look at an example, but we won't have time to go through the much detail. Um, and then to actually produce the plots, well, if you type just make dot plots, uh, it would check the dependencies, and then uh, once it has up to date output, it would use the set plot to produce a set of plots. And, and if you do this make.plots, it creates actually a set of web pages. It makes PNG files for each of the different figures that you specified at each of the output times. Uh, and then it assembles those into web pages that make it easy to kind of browse through them. And it also automatically creates some animations that just loop through the PNG files in, in JavaScript, basically, in order to, to view the results easily. Um, so that's kind of the easiest way to make the plots. On the other hand, you can't really zoom in dynamically or explore the data. Uh, and so often when I'm developing code, I instead would use the IPython shell and do things more interactively. And in that case, we have another set of tools, this IPlotFlaw interactive uh, plotting package that allows you to take the same setplot.py, but loop through it and display one frame at a time in a way that you can interact with the plot and zoom in on it, plot additional things on top of it if you want to do. So if you if you start this up and then uh, start up a plot loop and type question mark, it would give you a, a list of different commands that are valid at that point. Uh, and in the uh, the pack documentation under this cloud there's some more description of how to use those tools. Okay, so uh, that's the end of the slides. And what I'd like to do now is sort of switch to actually running some code and showing some plots. Um, and if you want to follow along, there, the examples I'll be using are in this GitHub repository, which also has this tiny URL um, down here. Uh, I also just uh, this morning posted HTML, the two notebooks that we'll be looking at, so you can also look at them. Um, 
just as HTML files, so you don't have to be running anything, but you can still kind of follow through the, the description of what I'm doing. And there's some animations that are embedded that should work even in the HTML versions. So I'm going to switch over to and here is the GitHub repository. Um, again, is it this tiny URL? Or if you go to this repository and you click this button, then you'll get a um, HTML version of the notebooks. You can follow along on those if you want. Um, so what's in this repository is a couple of versions of this Chile 2010 example that we were looking at. Um, that kind of walk you through how do you change the number of levels of refinement, how do you add additional uh, regions where you say you want or don't want refinement, how do you add gauges, and that kind of thing. Um, and I'll go quickly through some of this. We don't have too much time left, so, um, but I hope that these notebooks will help you to kind of walk through things. Um, so another option for running the notebooks is to launch Binder. And, you do that, then it actually starts up a, a server in the cloud that has all of the dependencies running and this repository clone so that you can be running the, the, uh, the notebooks there. Um, but what I'll be looking at here is just on my own laptop. This is the version on my laptop. So if you go to that repository, what you'll find is those uh, two directories, geoflaw examples and notebooks. Both of them have the same two examples in them, but the GeoClaw examples version is sort of more the version we would normally use running things at the command line. The notebooks is kind of a tutorial version that walks you through it in, in the framework of a notebook. Um, so maybe first I will just show you how we would sort of run things normally at a terminal. So here's a terminal window. Um, and uh, I'm in this directory, GeoClaw examples to 2010B, this is the more interesting one. Um, and at the moment, if I do ls minus a, um, what you see is that this is sort of the, what you should get if you clone the repository. It's set run.py, set plot.py, a make file, a make topo.py. This view plots.ipy and b can be useful if you're running things on Docker and then want to view the, the plots on your laptop outside the Docker that we might be using that today. Uh, this 32412notide.txt is some tight gauge or darkly gauge output to compress. Um, and so if we do, we could just do make.plots, but if we sort of go through it step by step, make.exe would create the executable. In this case, most of the code is already compiled, so it's basically just linking those .o files together, but it makes this xgeoplot executable. And then if I do make.data, it runs setrun.py, and creates a bunch of data files. You know, so it prints out a bunch of things about what it's doing. It also, by the way, I think the way this is set up, it makes some KML files, which are often useful. You can open these in Google Earth, and it shows, for example, what region the, this is the region where the DTOPO, the, the earthquake source, uh, is specified. This DTOPO file is a global topography at 10 minute resolution that's being used as our background topography. Um, if you have gauges, there's also a gauges.kml that can do the work to show you what gauges are for um, So once we've made the data, we now have a bunch of files that end in .data, which you can look at what those look like, but they're basically just lists of parameters that are read in by the Fortran code. So also, if we do ls minus a, we now see this, this hidden file .data is created. It's the timestamp of that that's used to Tell if I do make that data again, and they'll probably say it's up to date. Um, yeah, that data is up to date. Um, yeah, this other warning about target all is just because we redefined the, the target all in this particular make file. If you actually look at this make file, um, it specifies you know, where the set run file is, where the output should go, and various other things, and then down towards the bottom, it specifies some uh, particular source code that's needed for this geoflow application. Uh, but then we've also defined this um, make topo. <coughs> if you do make space topo, it, it runs make topo.py, which actually downloads the topography that you need and creates the, the dtopo file using the Okada model. And so you find all to make topo and make plots and make that HTML just makes sense. 
HTML versions of some of these guys. So if we also do make topo, um, I guess I've already downloaded that, so it didn't download it again. Uh, and then, yeah, these files are actually stored in the scratch directory. They were already there, so it didn't have to regenerate them to the PRAM and network the first time. Hopefully, download some quality and, and create a deeper file. And then if you do make that output, um, it actually runs the code, produces several outputs, and then reports on tiny information at the end, and then make that plots. You would actually use the information that's in setplot.py to create um, a bunch of frames of output, and then eventually that will go into this directory, I believe. Um, so once that's run, then if you open up this underscore plots plot index page, then it shows um, all of the frames that were created, say, at, uh, at two different figures that were specified here, one showing the full domain and one zooming in on the coast of Peru. You can either look at all of the figures and zoom in on a particular one by clicking on it and step through it, or back from the index page if you go to the JS movies, the JavaScript version of the movies, this just loops through all of the different frames and shows you a different animation. Um, so that's how we typically would use GeoClog using also then editing the setrun.py, for example, by hand with whatever editor you like. And if you go in here, you'll see that there's many different things specified in terms of the domain, the number of grid cells. Uh, lots of other parameters, but rather than trying to walk through that file, um, these two notebooks that are, oops, that was the binder version I was testing out this morning. Yeah, so the Chile 2010A notebook that's in the, in the repository in the notebooks directory um, walks you through an example like this, and there's some instructions on what you would do if you were working at the command line, but we also have some tools that allow you to do the same kind of thing within the notebook, which we use mostly for making tutorials like this, but could be handy for making other sorts of um, files that illustrate how you created some results for Geoclog, for example. So um, if what we did in the command line was just to make topo, compile the code with make.exe, create the plots with make.plots, and what it produced is, um, well, if we had run it in this first version, actually 2010A, it's set up to use only a single force grid with no adaptive refinement at all. It runs very quickly, but it produces a very coarse resolution, as we see here. Um, and so there are then some instructions in here about how to go in and modify that file, what you would change uh, in the setrun.py file. You could either make it finer by increasing the, the resolution of the coarsest grid, or what I suggest here instead is to change the number of AMR levels from one to two, so that there's two levels of refinement to start with, and then we'll add more below. And already in this file, there's some lines that look like this that set the refinement factor in X and Y, uh, and also in, in T. So we refine by a factor of two going from level one to level two in, in both X and Y, uh, actually, in the T direction, there's another parameter that said elsewhere that, that tells it to kind of dynamically choose the refinement ratio in time. Um, which typically for these explicit methods, if you're refining by a factor of, of L in each spatial dimension, you also have to refine by the same factor in time in order to maintain the stability of the explicit numerical method. But because the wave speed depends on the depth of the water, if you have very fine grids that are only near shore, then you may not have to refine as much in time as you do in space because the, the wave speed may be much smaller in those fine grids than it is in the, the coarser grids out in the ocean. And so we have another parameter that's not mentioned here that can be set to tell GeoClaw that it will adaptively choose the time step on each level based on the wave speed which is what we normally use. Um, so adding the second level, if you redo, if you redo make that plots and then look at the plots that get produced again, then you should see something like this. 
Um, it's added a second level, refining by a factor of two, um, but it doesn't look like it's done a very good job. You see that um, it's not really capturing all of the wave uh, as it propagates out, and that's because there's some refinement criterion that's being used in this case to determine which cells need to be refined to the next level. And I've purposely chosen a, a value that's sort of too large for that tolerance here so that much of the wave is getting lost as, as it propagates out. So um, the next experiment would be to go in and change this wave tolerance parameter from 0.1 to 0.02, for example, uh, and then rerun the code. And in that case, what comes out is, um, again, using only two levels, but it's now refining pretty much everywhere that there's waves. And it's, again, it flags points for refining and then clusters them into rectangles here. Flags the most efficient thing. It's just one big rectangle that covers most of the domains. It's here. That's such coarse grids in this example. And then the rest of this notebook sort of walks through adding a third level. So if we have three levels, then we have to tell it how to refine going from level one to two and also how to refine going from level two to three. So we need to add another component to these refinement ratios here. I've said again, a, a factor of two, but it could be a factor of four or eight or maybe an odd factor. Uh, in some applications, we use factors of 10 or 20, even going from one level to the next. We often have, if we're modeling a tsunami across the ocean and then zooming in on a coastal location, we may have um, refinement factors of more than 10,000 going from the coarsest level to the finest level using maybe six levels of refinement. Um, in this case, I've added in a third level with additional refinement by two. And in the setplot.py, you can specify that on, on this finest level, we don't want to plot the grid lines because otherwise it would just be solid black in there. And so this lets us to see the, the waves. And also slow the animation down a bit here. See what's happening. So now we see that the level three grid is really kind of following the, the waves and it's refining everywhere that, that the wave tolerance is above this 0.02. It's just looking at the amplitude of the, the surface of the ocean relative to sea level. Anywhere that it's above two centimeters in this case, it's five days of medium refinement. Now you might say, well, that's great up here, but we really didn't want to refine this wave that's heading towards Antarctica and off into the Atlantic. So there are also capabilities in GeoClaw to, to specify that uh, in a certain regions, we want to only allow two levels or force it to always have three levels regardless of the, the tolerance, some combination of those. So you can specify uh, what we call regions, refinement regions that are sort of rectangular space-time regions. Um, you can say over one time period, we need to refine this rectangle over a later time period, it's a different rectangle that we want to try to follow the, the waves as they propagate across the ocean. And so this next, next example gives a, a example of how you might do that. Um, and if you do that example, then in this case, it's refining the, the waves that are propagating northward up the coast. Okay, well, we're about out of time. So I think I won't go through the, the other one that, 2010B, but if you take a look at that one, it walks you through adding some gauges to the simulation and then comparing the results uh, at the simulated gauge with some of the actual high gauge data, or dark blue data in this case, uh, and also how you can, in Python, work with gauges to put an additional gauge someplace, read in the data, and plot not only the surface elevation, but also the Include velocities, for example, like this. Um, so these examples uh, should work in this repository. I was having a little trouble getting it all working on Binder the other day with the Docker files and all, but I think it's working now. So um, if something isn't working for you, let me know, and I'll try to get that fixed. Um, I hope these will be a useful introduction to how to get started with the GeoClock. Um, if you run into to problems, we do have a, a mailing list for a claw bash users mailing list on um, Google groups that you can find from the, the clawback documentation. We also have uh, in the clawback repositories there are um, 
issues and all of the repositories you can raise an issue if you think you found a bug or a problem is doing something to work with. You need some help with. So thank you very much for joining this webinar and I hope uh, this has been useful.